recently, I, I actually wrote this blog post announcing our uh, open source of the Kenda UI core, uh, which is all of Kenda UI mobile and a large chunk of Kenda UI web. Um, and uh, the repo is available up on GitHub. And uh, I love the fact you guys are using Kenda UI. That's great. So uh, that makes me really, really happy. And uh, I'm more than happy to show you all the parts and pieces of the Telerik platform. Uh, Abhishek's done a great job of explaining everything so far. So um, just so you guys are aware, we're going to have a webinar a little bit later today, a little bit later tonight for you guys, actually. Um, it's uh, this one that you see on the, the homepage of our website. So if you go to Telerik.com, that's our homepage. Uh, hopefully you guys have either made that your homepage or at least bookmarked it. Uh, you can click on this little red button here that says register now. Um, I and my colleagues will be um, hosting this webinar later tonight, um, 3 a.m. my time, but uh, that has never stopped me in the past. So what we're doing is we're just kind of providing an overview of what's latest and greatest in Kenda UI. So you might want to check that out. The recording will be available on YouTube, so not to worry if you can't make it, I understand. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, the Telerik platform. So we, we have a, a link here on our homepage, uh, which... You can, you can click on, it gives a, an overview of what Abhishek talked about, and then you can drill into the various p parts and pieces of uh, Telerik by looking at the individual products themselves. Uh, given the fact you guys have used Telerik in the past, I'm going to assume you're familiar with some of our UI controls. The stuff that's new that I'm going to be talking about here today is the stuff that I'm highlighting here, which is, um, for lack of a better term, called DevCloud. It is Telerik platform, but uh, really, the way that we're approaching this is the top part of this is our UI, and then it's underpinned by services. So the services or dev cloud is what we're going to talk about here today. And if you click on any of these links, you can see the various aspects or marketing, if you will, for, for all of that. Uh, Abhishek also mentioned we have ALM and testing solutions as well. And we have a wicked, wicked uh, CMS called Sitefinity. It's fantastic. So definitely worth checking out. When you sign up for your account, which is free, uh, you're gonna see a page that looks like this. This is the homepage for the Telerik platform. Uh, this is uh, called workspaces. Uh, workspaces are like collections of projects. So workspace is, uh, it's a collection of not only projects, but also users uh, for those projects. And by users, I mean members, uh, collaborators, viewers, administrators, et cetera, because the reality is, is you're going to build multiple projects with Telerik platform, and you're going to want to have these units of, of isolation or separation between them. Uh, I have some fictitious ones that I've just been using here for Australian demos. Uh, you'll, you'll probably get the reference here. Uh, there's a lot of dangerous creatures in, in Australia. Uh, so that's why I jokingly refer to these as my Australian demo. But I'll show you what this looks like when we create a workspace. So a workspace, as I said before, is a set of, of projects. Uh, we're just going to go ahead and call this Telerik India. We're going to create the workspace. Incidentally, I want to just mention here briefly that everything that I'm that I'm showing you here through the website can be done through other tools as well. So if you briefly just jump over to our products page, um, you'll see that we have integration points. Everything I'm going um, I'm going to show you here can be also run within a number of different IDEs. So we believe in choice at Telerik. So uh, we don't we don't uh, mandate a particular IDE. So everything I'm showing you here is the in-browser client, but Everything that I'm doing, every single operation that I'm doing against this interface can be done either uh, via the in-browser client or any number of combinations. So we have a separate Windows client that's built in WPF. We have a uh, integration point with Visual Studio, which I'll show you a little bit later on. We have a Sublime text package, which integrates directly with this wonderful text editor. And then we have a CLI. Uh, this is really great for scenarios where you're wanting to do continuous integration or you're wanting to integrate with existing systems. Um, so having a CLI at your disposal allows you to, to uh, um, basically explore integration scenarios, which is wonderful. So everything, and the reason why that's enabled, enabled or facilitated is because everything we have is underpinned by an API. So inside of our workspace, it's similar to Visual Studio, where we have project types. We have project types inside of our workspace. Uh, those are broken down into these main categories here, app builder, backend services, analytics, mobile testing, app feedback, and prototyping. And if you, if you guess at what these things do, you'll start to see how we try to address all the various aspects of the hybrid mobile uh, development lifecycle. So everything from prototyping to building to testing to reporting to backend services to feedback, et cetera. 
and everything in between, we surface out through this facility. Uh, really where a lot of people will start is in this one here called App Builder. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and show you what this looks like here. So when you go ahead and create a new App Builder project, this is really where a lot of your work is going to be done. Um, and I, I just want to say one more thing before I move on. Those various parts and pieces I showed you earlier, uh, I'll just jump back here quickly. Um, these these are not meant to be taken as as one big pill, if you will. You can take only the parts and pieces you need or want. You, there's no dependency or interdependencies between them. So that means you can use them in silos, uh, which really it, it allows you to have a modular approach towards the Telerik platform. It's like a buffet table. You can take what you want and leave the rest. So uh, we believe, again, in choice for that matter. So when I create a new uh, uh, App Builder project, this is really where I'm, I'm doing a lot of my, my uh, development. So we start with these basic project template types. Uh, we have one which is blank. Um, we do leverage Apache Cordova, otherwise known as PhoneGap, uh, which is our app container framework for building hybrid mobile apps. It is the sort of canonical way in which uh, folks are building uh, hybrid apps today. If you haven't seen or explored PhoneGap at all, uh, this is a uh, open source project. Uh, it's, a, it's an Apache project. It's, it's under the guise of Adobe. Uh, the team that works there, uh, we actually have a very good relationship with these folks, uh, and they actually really appreciate what we're doing. Um, but we utilize a, a PhoneGap slash Apache Cordova as our app container, which is why you see it listed in our uh, our list of project templates. We have a, a one called uh, App Builder Friends, which is just sort of a Hello World type app. We have a project template that uses jQuery Mobile, and then we have ones that use jQuery, Mo uh, sorry, Kendo UI Mobile and Kendo UI DataViz. Um, just to complete the story, we have a bunch of sample projects as well. These are uh, either a set of de demo applications or applications that demonstrate a core function of PhoneGap. So PhoneGap, as you may be aware, um, provides not only an app container, uh, but it also surfaces up into the web stack uh, a number of missing, if you will, APIs that web technologies don't have access to. So the camera, the uh, the contacts, the compass, etc. We've we've basically created all these sort these core API apps that you can take a look at. We have a bunch of APIs uh, for advanced scenarios as well, including barcode scanners, Facebook integration, a, fa a flashlight, which everyone needs, um, pinch and zoom. SQLite, uh, very, very common scenario for offline scenarios, et cetera, and other ones as well. Uh, you can also clone repos. So you can point to a Git-based repo, uh, whether that's TFS, Bitbucket, uh, GitHub, et cetera. So I'm just going to start from a basic project here. Uh, let's go with Kendo UI DataViz. I'm a big fan of uh, data, so I'll just call this one Data is Awesome. And uh, we'll go ahead and create this project. Now, what's going to happen here is Telerik Platform is going to provision for me an environment where I can do all of my coding. Uh, this environment is shared across all my users. So if I wanted to, I could do collaborative development. Um, and inside of this environment, as you'll see in a second, uh, we have a number of facilities that Abhishek touched on, such as a backend build service, the ability to deploy, uh, publish, et cetera, et cetera. So here's our workspace. On the right-hand side here, you'll notice that we have a project navigator, very similar to other IDE experiences like Eclipse and Visual Studio, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can see the project structure has been built out as such. We have our Cordova, Cordova JS file with our subdirectories for uh, each corresponding platform. We have a bunch of folders and associated files inside them. They're not particularly relevant to this conversation. They're just the building blocks of our app. And then we have um, a, a couple of uh, items here for properties and plugins. So I'll just show you what this looks like. We surface out all the XML-y stuff that you would have to deal with in PhoneGap through a really nice interface. So you don't have to deal with XML files. You simply drop into this properties dialog. You can specify splash screens. You can specify icons. You can specify, specify permissions. You can specify per capabilities. All this is surfaced out through the properties window. And in addition to that, you can also enable core or uh, custom plugins that will integrate with a uh, with Cordova. So you can turn these on or off. You can integrate them directly. They are surfaced out and available through the Navigator object, which is the default way in which you will do stuff within PhoneGap. Uh, if you bring up a text file, uh, we have syntax highlighting. We have a number of key bindings as well. We support Emmet. We support a whole bunch of other things 
um, you know, it's it's a standard sort of ID. If you've used Cloud9 or or Visual Studio or or uh, or Sublime Text, it's it will feel very natural. It's it's really not relevant to talk too much about it because uh, you know we provide all those capabilities. Um, down here at the bottom, we have the ability of jumping into what's called a designer, uh, very similar to the WYSIWYG designers you'll see in other in, in, um, experiences. Uh, on the left, we have our UI library. These are our Kenda UI widgets. Uh, on the right, we have our outline inspector and our property inspectors. This allows us to manipulate uh, the, the various elements on our page. You'll notice that it is a live view here, so I can actually um, touch on one of these and I can modify its properties, and that will actually uh, feed that data back down into the underlying markup. And uh, we can actually demonstrate this by going to a split view. For example, I can go in here, I can call this, you know, uh, the Telerik India chart, for example, save changes. And you can see the the uh, the view itself will go ahead and self-update, render the content accordingly, and you can see the update there. So uh, kind of a nice experience, you know, allows you to basically get real-time updates. Um, and you can, as natural with Kenda UI Mobile, you can go ahead and swap out the various skins and we, we go ahead and support that as well. So uh, really nice from a development perspective. Uh, everything is feels pretty natural. Uh, you can go ahead and target these experiences. And so I think that from that perspective alone, you've got a lot of power and flexibility there, but uh, that's just scratching the surface of, of what's what's possible in terms of the, uh, the uh, app builder itself. So, once we've gone ahead and built out our solution, we're happy with, you know, basically uh, how we've constructed this thing. Uh, we'll go ahead and start uh, creating uh, builds. Now, another thing you can do here is you can actually execute this in the confines of a simulator. So we have a number of simulators that will uh, replicate device environments. So as Abhishek mentioned, if you're on Windows, you can still target iPhone, despite the fact you don't have Xcode installed or the, uh, the iPhone or iOS simulator. Um, so you can see we go ahead and spawn this inside of a browser window. It, it is uh, near full fidelity to the device experience. Uh, so you can simulate all kinds of things like location, network, uh, the, the, the status of the radio, uh, even the version of the, the, the operating system itself running inside the confines of the, uh, the window itself. So really, really nice. This is a live view. So uh, you can go ahead and interact with this. I know that the frame rate doesn't do this a lot of justice, uh, but trust me, it's it's highly responsive and um, works really really nice. It's it's actually you know I really like Ken UI for a reason, uh, despite the fact that I've been on the team for a while. Uh, I really enjoy using it a lot because it actually does provide so much power and flexibility. So these simulators are great. They provide a really really rich experience for building these things out. But obviously, sometimes it's better to have these sitting on the device. So for that, we have a set of backend build services. So here you can see we can select our target platform. All of this, by the way, you can actually drive, as I said before, through any IDE that you, you're using that we support, uh, a CLI as well. In fact, let me just show you that quickly. I'm just gonna jump over here to the terminal window. Here is the CLI we have, it's called App Builder. Uh, you can see the variety of commands we have for App Builder itself. So for example, I can go ahead and uh, if, for example, let's say, let me jump back into here to my roots. I'm gonna go ahead and say App Builder, create, uh, I'll go ahead and say foo, and then I'll give it an app ID of uh, the following. When I do that, you'll notice that it creates this project called foo. If we go ahead and jump in there and just do a directory, a directory listing, you can see all of that has been spit out by our CLI. Uh, and you'll notice that the CLI itself has commands for also uh, generating builds, like I'm showing you inside the web uh, client. Uh, we can go do remote deploys. We can do live sync, which is a technology that uh, allows you to make changes to the code and will automatically synchronize those changes on a connected live device. A uh, whole bunch of other range of things that you can do through the CLI. But again, I'm just showing you what the CLI can do. So we're going to go ahead and build for iOS. Now, when we do this, you'll notice that we have actually a couple of options here. Uh, the, the option here is, uh, we have two options here. Basically, we can target what's called a app builder companion app, or we can create the sort of canonical um, app package, the IPA file. Um, and this is utilized, uh, a, a backend service that we have that will utilize my developer certificate. So unfortunately, we don't, we don't circumvent uh, Apple's developer program. You still have to go to developer.apple.com. You still have to register a developer profile. You still have to get a certificate. But once you facilitate, once you get all that stuff, 
uh, done and you you provide us with your certificate, we will go through the the process of signing your your uh, your app packages and make them available. So uh, I can go through this. This is just utilizing our backend build service. Again, you can issue this through Visual Studio. Uh, let me just jump over here and show you Visual Studio. So uh, while that's building, I'll just quickly show you the integration part here. Um, so I can jump in here to App Builder. Uh, I can go ahead and say, you know, it's a classic sort of example of Visual Studio. Uh, so I can say File, New Project, exact same project template uh, types that I showed you earlier. We click on OK. Uh, we can create a project here that we'll go ahead and then synchronize with App Builder. Uh, the, the project structure is um, exactly the same. I can go ahead and issue builds. I have a integrated simulator experience. Uh, so everything I'm doing in the web client is exactly the same as what you can do in Visual Studio, in Sublime Text, and CLI, et cetera, et cetera. So we preserve that experience across different uh, choices that you wish to make. So our, our guidance is use what makes you happy. Uh, our, our, our role here is just to facilitate that. So I've gone ahead and created this build. If I go ahead and click on this link, it will download the IPA, uh, and then I can go ahead and deploy through iTunes. But that's a little slow. Uh, maybe I want something a little bit quicker. For that, we can use the other option, which is our app companion. So this is a, uh, a tool that is available up on the App Store. Uh, and the way that this works is, I'll just briefly show you how this actually works. I'm going to go ahead and share my live iPhone. I'm going to go ahead and mirror this. This is my actual live device here. So you can see as I'm using my thumb here, it's actually scrolling here. Uh, there's an app available on the App Store called App Builder. You go ahead and download that guy. You're going to see an experience that looks like this. Uh, this, is a, this is an app that I was just building, a fictitious app that allows you to rate spiders in Australia. I was writing this for a customer uh, just as a joke. Um, but what this facility allows you to do is quickly uh, deploy apps to your device. So if I go ahead and swipe over with two fingers, you'll notice that we have a built-in QR scanner. And that's relevant because I have a QR code sitting in front of me. So if I go ahead and turn this on, you can see this is live. These are my hands. So I'll do this just to prove that it's live. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to go ahead and scan that. You'll notice that when I scan that QR code, it's going to go ahead and pull down the app package. And that app package is the Kendi UI DataViz project that I built. You'll notice that Telerik India is reflected in my interface there. I can go ahead and utilize this. This is all Kendi UI here. So it's going to be highly responsive. It's going to provide a whole bunch of facilities that are great um, you know, for building out these experiences. As I said before, I'm a big fan of DataViz, but there you go. Uh, so wonder, wonderful facilities there uh, and gives you quick and easy means to deploy directly to your device. Now, you'll notice we provide guidance here on how to use this. Uh, one of the things is you can tap and hold with three fingers. And what that will do is uh, automatically uh, get the live changes that have been made to the uh, the app underneath the cover. So if I wanted to say get rid of Telerik India and replace it with uh, say hello chart. Uh, if I go ahead and save this on my live device, let me just go ahead and make sure I'm all in code mode here because I don't want to wreck the uh, designer experience. If I go ahead and hold three fingers against the device here, What's going to happen is, um, excuse me, sorry, my fingers are a little bit big, so that's probably why it's not uh, going to do that. So I'm holding three fingers against the device. I've gone ahead and just saved those. I haven't rebuilt anything, but it's going to go ahead and pull that down. You'll notice that the title has actually changed to Hello Chart. So that's a facility we have called LiveSync. And what, what we're, our intention there is to basically uh, make the development process more iterative and quicker. So we're trying to facilitate a faster iteration process for development. Uh, especially for devices, which can be very, very uh, difficult, especially in the in the face of simulators like Android that take minutes to load. Uh, I know Android Studio is getting a little bit better with that, but uh, you know, even with solutions like Jenny Motion, it's it's not going to be ideal. So you want to short circuit that. You want to make it as fast as possible. So that's the build service that we have there. And of course, we support builds for Android and Windows Phone as well. Uh, so we allow you to uh, prototype and test against those environments. Uh, I'll just mention up here quickly, we also have integrated version control. So everything everything you make a change to, you can go ahead and uh, obviously create branches, push, pull, etc. Configure remote repositories for GitHub, etc. Uh, so that's all facilitated there. Not terribly, not terribly interesting. Uh, publication is really interesting. So the other thing we support is the ability to publish directly to app stores. So once you've built your application, you feel like it's ready to go, you can publish directly to the iOS or uh, App Store or Google Play. Uh, but what I'd like to show you is a facility we have called App Manager, uh, which is really nice because it allows you to manage internal deployment. 
So this is a scenario where you've built your app and you're not really ready to make it available to the world, but you want to give it to your internal QA team or testers or CTO or whatever. So with App Manager, you can go ahead and um, actually issue the same, you can create your basically your own app stores inside your own organization. So I'm going to go ahead and publish to App Manager and I'll show you what this looks like inside the, the tool itself. And so we're transitioning now from uh, App Builder into App Manager. And this is the uh, next step in the story of managing your, your development lifecycle in terms of uh, mobile experiences. Um, so the reason why this is taking a little bit, the, these build times will vary. Um, and uh, uh, the reason for that is based on obviously the project itself. Uh, but once it's built, this usually takes about 30 seconds. Once it's built, it will go ahead and push it to App Manager. And then in a second, we'll see how this actually um, surfaces out through the tool. So it's going to upload it to App Manager, and then we're just going to go ahead and jump into App Manager directly to see what that looks like. So we'll jump into App Manager now. And uh, App Manager is a way, as I said before, of managing internal private secure deployments of your own apps for QA testing, etc. So when we jump in here, uh, we're going to see an environment that shows me all the apps that I've built so far. Uh, there's the one that I just published called Data is Awesome. Uh, it doesn't look terribly nice right now, but uh, that's because I haven't actually gone through the process of creating a, a highly, you know, a, a nice graphic or anything like that. Uh, you can see the requirements for this. I can go ahead and edit the details. Let me jump into one that I've created earlier. Uh, this is for a, a fictitious scenario that I was just building out for a customer here in Australia for raiding spiders that uh, that we have. I know that India has some great spiders as well. So this is one I called, called uh, one I built called Arachnogram. And uh, as you can see here, um, you can go ahead and, and give it a, a, a screenshot. You can go ahead and give it a description. Uh, you can also get uh, the ratings that your users are giving this application um, uh, surfaced out here. Taking a look at the edit screen here, this is how we go ahead and manage the apps themselves. So you can use this not only for hybrid apps, you can also use this for native apps. So, um, you know, all the stuff that you're, you're describing, all the stuff that's being done here, you can go ahead and, and set accordingly. Um, we also have the notion of users and groups. So as you deploy applications, you can assign rights and distributions to those uh, those users. So just quickly jumping over to App Manager again. Uh, and this is just from the admin side. So I'll show you in a second what the uh, actual development experience, or sorry, the user experience looks like on the, on the client side uh, when you're inside of App Manager itself. So here, uh, I can, you can see, notice, I can also choose which ones I wish to publish and which ones I don't. If we jump over to the users page here, these are a bunch of users. Uh, I can also, and you can see their list of devices, for example. Uh, and then I can also uh, jump into groups. And groups are good because they allow you to designate which, um, which, uh, which apps are designated to which group. So you can create these on the fly, invite users, and away you go. Now, just briefly jumping over to my iPhone, I'm just going to show you what this looks like on the client side. So let's assume I'm uh, I'm a member of the QA team and I want to go ahead and test out a, uh, a an app that's been published. So we have this another tool called App Manager that sits on the phone. You can see there are the two apps that I've gone ahead and published called uh, Arachno Arachnogram and Sharkometer. I can jump into that same app that I showed you earlier. And uh, so it's a little bit slow on the rendering side. That's because I'm um, dealing just with, uh, you know, pulling this down on the device. But you can see I can take a look at screenshots. I can go ahead and rate the application. Uh, I can also download and install this. So the way this works is via the ITMS services integration with the iPhone itself. This is very similar to other solutions out there like TestFlight, uh, which you may be familiar with. It's the exact same experience. You go ahead and download the application directly to your phone. And so it allows you to control... Uh, basically, which apps get deployed to which customers or rather internal users. In addition to that, you also get a list of updates if there are any, and we have support for push notifications to users when new updates are available. Um, so really a nice facility for managing your deployments. All right. So let me go ahead and jump back into the Telerik platform itself. I'm going to jump back into the workspace that I just created. And let's touch on some other aspects of the development lifecycle itself. So obviously another part or another key part of this is backend data. So we have a whole set of services that you can underpin your application with. I'm just going to go ahead and call this data. Uh, this is similar to solutions uh, available from Azure, for example, Azure Mobile Services. 
uh, is uh, very analogous to the solution we have here. Uh, in many ways, we provide a similar set of solutions. Ours is very well integrated with the Telerik platform. So if you're already an existing Telerik customer, uh, this will integrate with a number of our UI suites. So the way this works is you have the ability of persisting data up into the cloud. Uh, this is in a uh, what's called a content type. These are sort of analogous to tables in a database, except we use a NoSQL-esque backend uh, called MongoDB. And the reason why we do that is because we get very low latency, high throughput, and that's a very important when you have uh, a number of mobile apps and, and services using this. Uh, but again, because of the modularity of Teller Platform, you don't have to use this for mobile apps. Uh, you can use this for other services as well. Uh, we have built-in support for uh, binary types called files, so I can upload and download uh, binary types. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have uh, support for authentication and authorization. So here we have a built-in provider for uh, uh, authentication against user uh, types. Uh, we have integration points with Active Directory, face, uh, OAuth providers such as Twitter, Facebook, and Google+. Um, and we can establish uh, authorization through roles, uh, which we've established here as well. We have push notification support, uh, cross-cutting mobile uh, platforms such as Android, iOS, and Windows Phone. Uh, and so I can send out these push notifications very easily. You can go ahead and say hello world for any uh, apps that have registered. And then what's really nice about this is I can actually register what's called a segment, which is um, a list of criteria that I wish to uh, define. So if I want to say the hardware model is iOS, that is, this is a segment that I wish to send this tech, text message to. I can also go ahead and send these now or on a specific date. Um, I can either uh, do that or I can expire the messages so I can send it after a specific time or ne or on a specific date. Um, integration points with this is surfaced out through the backend services setting module, which you'll see here. So I can go into push notifications here and I can enable these for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. Very simple to do. The other thing that we do provide out of the box is templated emails. So oftentimes when people are building out a, a mobile app, they want to underpin it with you know templated emails. A good example is if I'm signing into a mobile app, uh, I may want to have a welcome email saying, welcome to our new mobile app. You can see here we use this sort of double mustache notation for placeholders for, uh, for these. And so we provide a SMTP service, mail service, uh, on your behalf for all these operations, such as when a user signs up, when a user changes their password, uh, when a user verifies their email, when a user chooses to reset their password. So you don't need to provision a mail server. You don't need to set up all these rules. We, we provide and service this out through this email functionality. And of course, everything is, is also uh, highly customizable on the server side as well. So we have this notion of what's called uh, cloud code, which is you're able to execute code on the uh, on the Telerik backend services side. Uh, and so we have integration or hooks into uh, all the operations that go into or out of uh, your types. So anytime a call comes in or goes out, uh, you can go ahead and, and uh, integrate with that. We also provide a set of libraries that will integrate with our backend services. So you don't need to write a lot of custom code, we provide libraries, uh, native libraries as well for integrating with all of that. So let's just jump back to the workspace. That's very quickly to uh, Telerik backend services. We also have mobile testing, uh, which I'll just quickly show you. Uh, so the way that this works is in the current iteration right now, the Telerik mobile testing part is really for surfacing out uh, reports. Uh, these reports you'll go ahead and share across the members of your team. But in, in practical terms, this actually lives on uh, uh, an actual um, uh, person's machine for testing. So just to, by way of demonstration, uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump into another terminal window here. Uh, so when you go ahead and download this, it will actually run as a node-based uh, uh, command um, here, which means that it can actually uh, run on both Mac and on Windows. And so I'm going to go ahead and just... Um, Go ahead and just fire this up. So what we see here is the interface for Telerik mobile testing. Uh, these are the tests that I've written that I wish to run against a set of agents. So the agents are a set of devices that you wish to connect and uh, execute tests against. And so the way that we hook this up is very simply just by 
pointing your, your iOS or Android device against uh, this IP address. Or alternatively, you can actually run native tests against this. So the tests themselves are written in JavaScript, which means that they're very flexible, meaning you can actually target not only uh, hybrid tests, but also web tests, as well as native tests. So here, I've gone ahead and, and defined a set of web tests. If I wanted to, and I'll just quickly show you what this looks like here. If I wanted to, I could quickly uh, wire this up to a mobile browser. Um, and this, let's just assume the example. I can show you two examples of this. Uh, one where I've gone ahead and connected my own uh, browser here on the desktop to the uh, the running agent. Another example would be is if I wanted to connect uh, my mobile browser to the same agent itself. And I've gone ahead and done that here. So in this instance, I've got basically two, uh, two, two agents that I wish to run my web tests against. And so I can go ahead and connect those. And if we go ahead and refresh here, you can see that indeed I have Chrome, which is in this tab here. And I have Safari, which is my agent here. And so what this allows me to do is just run these tests um, against uh, uh, these connected clients. And so in this instance here, we've created this fictitious site called Telerik Tacos, just as a way of example to show you how these will execute. And as you can see, we can go ahead and, and run these tests and see the results of those tests executing. Uh, we've deliberately added some of these delays just to show you how these go ahead and fail. But these tests, as I said, are authored in JavaScript. They can go ahead and be executed uh, directly against um, either web clients, hybrid clients, or even native clients. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time to show you the native piece. But the way that works is just a library that you include in your build, and then you go ahead and execute tests uh, against that environment. Once that's been done, you'll go ahead and synchronize or publish the, uh, the test runs into this project suite that we have here called test suites. Um, this will go ahead and surface this data out to other members of your team. Um, eventually, what's going to happen with Telerik Platform is everything that I've shown you running on local host will go ahead and surface itself out through the cloud. So you won't have to provision an environment uh, on your local machine. Finally, uh, analytics. The, the other two parts here, which we don't have necessarily a lot of time to cover, but I'll just quickly show you here. Um, I'll, I'll touch on analytics, but I want to just mention briefly prototyping because I think it's important. Oftentimes, the gap that exists between developers and designers is very great, uh, often separated by a PSD or Photoshop. Uh, so in Prototyper, this is a project type that allows you to prototype uh, a number of designs for uh, applications that you're building. So I'm just going to uh, call this app prototype. And I'll just quickly show you what this looks like here. Uh, it is a bit rough right now because this is our first public beta. And not a lot of people have seen this, but I'll, I'll give you a glimpse into what this looks like, and then we'll finish off with analytics. So App Prototyper is really a means of, of facilitating communication with your design and, and dev team. So with App Prototyper, what you can do is design prototypes within uh, uh, the Telework platform that then can be shared with other members of your team. These app prototypes um, are, are somewhat live in a sense, in the sense that they can be linked and they can, they can encompass uh, a whole bunch of different facilities. So I'm going to go ahead and create a blank screen here. I'll call it home. And I'll go ahead and just drill into this. The design experience that we have here uh, basically allows you to drag and drop common sets of widgets onto a design surface. So on the left-hand side, we have common widgets for you know, iPhone, iPad, etc. Uh, these include things like, you know, progress bars and sliders and switches. I'm just going to quickly drag and drop these on the on the, the design surface here. But you can see how this all surfaces out. And, uh, you know, it allows me to create these, these experiences that look and feel a very high fidelity. Uh, what's nice about this is I can create other screens as well. And when I do them, uh, these other screens, I can go ahead and, and actually link them. And what this allows me to do is actually get a... Uh, a really nice integration point between these screens. And, and as a developer, I can start to understand the, the way in which the designer is, is wanting to prototype or, or basically design their application. So that is in a very, very brief description app prototyper. And I'd like to wrap up by showing you uh, one of my favorite parts of Telerik Platform, which is analytics. So I've saved the best for last. Analytics is a, a really, really nice facility that gives you in-app analytical data about what's happening in your app. This is different than other solutions out there like Google Analytics. Google Analytics is good. It can see the surface area of your application, but it can't really tell you what 
what things happen inside of your application. It's not deeply embedded within your app to give you that data. So what analytics uh, from Telerik provide is native, what are called monitors. And these monitors live within the, the confines of your app process space to track features, uh, exceptions, anything that happens within the app that your developers care about, we can track. And as you can see, we support a wide variety of different platforms, including hybrid. Uh, I'm going to utilize App Builder here just because it's easy. Um, I'll go ahead and call this Analytics. And when we create the project here, what we provide is a dashboard for seeing all of that data. And then we give you some bootstrapping code to get started. So the bootstrapping code here that we provide is just basically like how to get the monitor to start monitoring and then how to track things like features and exceptions. This will become a whole lot clearer when I jump over to another uh, workspace that has a lot of data within it. But I just wanted to show you this, this brief example of what this looks like when you get started. So as I said before, uh, we give you some bootstrapping code. This is JavaScript. Um, the, the relevant part here is this thing here that says monitor.start. This is basically the API that says, get going, start monitoring my, my application. On the left-hand side, you're going to see all these pivots. I'm going to just go jump over to a different account here. And this is another thing you can do. You can set up different accounts. You can go ahead and set up profiles and users. The reason why I'm doing this is because we actually have a product, or we actually have a number. All of Telerik's products actually utilize um, our backend uh, analytics for this. And I just wanted to show you a workspace we have set up that shows you some data. We have about seven years of data inside of this thing. And uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this is because it becomes a whole lot clearer as to the power of analytics when you see this. So on the top, you're going to notice we have a bunch of filters. This is the dashboard, by the way, that we provide. So what we're, what we're seeing here is the dashboard for analytics for tracking a Windows-based application. And so you can see here, I can, I can uh, go into the number of filters. And I can, let me get this out of the way. So I can see I have a sliding window that says, show me the data for this, this time period. So we're going over a four year period and you can see the charts really like, we're utilizing a lot of OLAP underneath to get really quick report generation. You can see the number of sessions that have been executed against this app over time. On the left-hand side here, we have a bunch of pivots and these are basically data reports. The stuff that you'll typically find in Google Analytics and stuff fall under this category called default data reports. So the default data reports are things like, when is my app being used? Where is it being used? Uh, what environments within which is it being used? I get a list of countries, for example. And again, this is just an app that this is not a website. This is an app that lives on Windows. And so we call home back to our cloud services to provide this information. But you can see here, these are the versions that are being used or by my customers. Uh, these, are, these are the typical environments that are, that are being hosted my app. Um, if I'm doing this in a, in a hybrid mobile or even native mobile sense, these will be reflected as iOS or Android or Windows Phone. Um, so you get a really good breakdown of what users are using. And I can also take a look at installations, for example. I can take a look at loyalty, all this sort of stuff. The really more interesting part for me as a developer are things like features and developer reports. Features are answering that question, what is your user actually using inside of your application? And feature reports can be customized to anything you want. You can see these descriptions aren't very meaningful, and that's because they're actually relevant to the, de to the app developer. The app developer has decided they want to track some things that are classified and relevant to them. So they want to see whether or not this is being run on Compact Framework or Windows Phone 7, for example. Uh, we can also do that in terms of timing. So we can actually do deltas between uh, a time start and time end. Let me go ahead and sh sh uh, collapse this window a little bit. So this is uh, basically showing you the average time that it takes for the GUI to render out across all of my different customers across the entire time period you see at the top. So you can see on average, about 40% of the time, the app fires up and displays the, UI, the GUI in about 40% of the time. So within one to three seconds. So that's pretty good. And what this gives you is insight into you know, if you regress or problems start leaking out, you're like, okay, what changed? Like we're immediately being able to be preemptive and fix the problem ahead of time. So it provides some really good data there. Um, just coming up to the filters again, I can go ahead and provide white and black lists. So I can say, just show me the GUI 
uh, start times for the latest version. So I can go ahead and set that up and say only include version three. And so I can start to get a better sense of that. Uh, I can also drill down on certain countries, like certain countries that don't have good bandwidth, for example. I can say, what's the average start time? Do we have any network dependencies in our in our application code that might change those values? For me, though, as a developer, the really nice part of this is the exception reports that we generate. So these are exceptions, errors that have been thrown and captured within my application. Uh, these can also cross-cut, by the way, hybrid native uh, mobile app development as well. So you'll notice we have this grid here. Everything that is built here, by the way, is built with Kenda UI. So if you want like an example of an app built with Kenda UI, everything you see here is built with Kenda UI. Uh, this is the Kenda UI grid, for example. And you can see here, we can go ahead and sort this by count. Um, and if we take a look at the most number of uh, errors being thrown by application, it's this one. Yeah. We drill down into this. This is where it gets really interesting. Not only do I see the error, the number of times it's occurred, uh, the number of affected users, I can also get the stack trace. This is so wow. awesome as a developer to have this information because it allows really me to get a better sense of where the problem may lie. So I can drill into these. I can see the various exceptions that have been generated. Um, and this will be particular based on the type of app monitor that you've created. If it's iOS, it will provide iOS stack traces. If it's JavaScript, it will provide a similar type, excuse me, types of uh, traces as well. Not only that, I can also go into a set of samples that have generated that exact same exception just to see, is it dependent upon the OS? Is it dependent upon the IP? Is it dependent upon anything else to help me track down this problem? The other thing I can do, and this is pretty cool as well, is I can actually uh, map these on a, on a timeline. So if, say, for example, you know, uh, say Abhishek's on my team and he pushes out the new build and then we see this huge spike in exceptions, I can then go to Abhishek's office and say, Abhishek, what happened, man? Like, we got all these exceptions. Why? You know, why is this happening? And the important thing here is that you're being preemptive, meaning you're, you're cutting off the problem before it becomes a phone call from a customer. I can also trace into live sessions. These are actual live sessions for a project we have um, that is using this. And I can actually see what features are being used uh, in that live session. So I can actually see, and I can be on a phone call with a customer because I'm like, can you click on this? And then you can just watch, are any exceptions being generated? So that's analytics. This is the part, one of the parts and pieces that I like the most, which is why I actually saved it for last. And I'm now up against the uh, time limit. So I will just round out by saying, uh, you know, we've got a lot of stuff for you guys to check out. You can go to our homepage at telework.com, take a look at all the stuff that we have there. Abhishek, I'll turn it back to you if you have any final thoughts or if there are any questions uh, from Samir or others. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, sure. Um, if uh, Samir has some questions, uh, uh, or Vyom had any questions. <coughs> uh, hello. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. OK, great. Actually, uh, this was very interesting for us. And uh, this one question I had actually uh, during the thing uh, is uh, when you were actually doing the iOS application builds, etc., you were utilizing uh, basically a developer profile. Does it also support an enterprise developer profile? Yes. OK. Yes. Because in an enterprise developer profile, you usually do not have uh, device IDs associated with the developer profile. Because sometimes we have to do distributions inside enterprises. And uh, we require to actually deliver uh, applications which can be you know, signed by the enterprise developer profile for the uh, enterprise itself. Understood. Um, I, I will I will feign ignorance and 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 say that uh, my my experience with provisioning and with certificates is the bare the bare minimum. Um, I try my best to understand it all. I'm not a security guy. I'm a code. I'm a coder. Um, but as 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 far as, far as I understand, uh, and this cross cuts of course into Android and Windows Phone. Um, we do all the relevant things that we can do relative to the platform itself. There are some things that we can't do uh, because they're just simply under the control or guise of, of the platform vendors. So you have to work with, as I said before, um, the developer programs that are available, whether it's enterprise profiles, for example, or developer profiles. Um, those, are, those are the constraints within which we live, unfortunately. OK. OK. Uh, another thing that I actually wanted to understand is that is the cloud services that you have. 
uh, what is the uh, model for that? Like for example, let's say if we build an application for a customer of ours, uh, utilizing the cloud services, mm -hmm. uh, the customer has to also purchase a license for that. Uh, or what is the uh, methodology associated with that? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll let Abhishek talk a little bit about that. But in the meantime, I'll just show you our pricing page relevant, relevant to that. We have a bunch of SKUs that you can go ahead and check out. And down near the bottom, this is on our pricing page, by the way. I'll just show you where I got there. Right on our homepage, you're going to see this big button called pricing. If you click on that, you're going to see this. Click on this buy now. You're not going to buy. Don't worry. Just click on buy now. And then you'll see these SKUs. It's broken up by annual and monthly subscriptions. And if you drill down, down here, down near the bottom, uh, you'll see that we have a breakdown for backend services. Our starter account uh, is limited to these uh, these these metrics, if, if if you will, and then we have a bunch of what are called data plans that you can take a look at as well. So if you take a look at our data plans, they're listed here. Abhishek, did you have anything you want to add there? Um, just that uh, the decision whether to um, get or whether to use your account for uh, backend services or whether to get a customer uh, another account for backend. Services really can, is is a business decision that should be made by the customer and the control that they want on their data because this would be uh, data that is that is sitting in that account. So depending on all the pricing that you just see here on the screen right now, uh, really the the answer for back end lies with uh, who wants to have uh, control over data, and I'm assuming that would be your customer, and consequently yeah. uh, the customer would need to have that access. Now, what we can do um, for development purposes is to actually get the customer to have the account, and then uh, they add you in the workspace so that you're able to work in it. And then, when it is live, they may then be able to remove you from the workspace for data confidentiality purposes. So that is how I would assume it to be. But really, more than the more than anything else, it is uh, data confidentiality at play here. Yeah. Um, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, it does. Other questions? Uh, no, nothing right now. Okay. There is one additional thing that I just wanted to leave you with, and it's something that is upcoming in our uh, features. Uh, all that you see in the back end uh, is actually also uh, being planned to put on premise. Uh, in case you come up to a point where the customer demands uh, that I can't leave my data out of my premises. So we're working on an, on an in-premise uh, solution for the entire backend that you see, uh, that you saw in operation uh, or being demoed by uh, John. So that's an offering that is coming up, but it would prove exceptionally powerful uh, if you have customers who are looking for that in-premise deployment for themselves. Okay. And that means that you will also have stuff like App Builder, etc., into the uh, on-premise deployment. Or you're talking only about the data services in uh, on-premise deployment? For for on-premise, it's actually um, it's it's actually well, all of Telerik platform that we're actually looking for support. Um, and uh, uh, we haven't really announced our our plans yet relative to that, but it is on our roadmap. Okay. okay. Sorry, Abhishek, did I interrupt you? I didn't mean to. Any other questions you guys have? No, nothing else. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to hit stop record just so I don't forget.